Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. Today's quick tip is the compound isolation sandwich, an awesome training technique that I developed in my secret training laboratory. We've got lasers, photon torpedoes. No, nope, that's a weapon from Star Trek. I remember one of the uh, early sort of pieces of feedback on the photon torpedo was that um, you won't be, you, you can't see a photon being fired from behind it or above it or anything else because it's ac actually light. Is it like coming back from it? In any case, I think the fucking super nerds that wrote Star Trek or whatever explained that technically it's just, it's just a term for a, not, it's not photons, it's just a torpedo, but it sounds cool. It sounds cool. Shut up, Mike. Star Trek's great. Easy, nerds. Easy. Don't get in the comments and then jump down my throat. I like Star Wars plenty. Whatever. Star Trek Wars, it's all the same. Again, I'm kidding. Please do not come after me. Or do come after me. What are you going to do about it? Write in the comments. Chewbacca. So, compound isolation sandwich. Compounds are great for muscle building, compound movements, multi-joint. Isolations are also good. And we know that whatever muscle group, or sorry, whatever exercise you do first tends to be your highest energy exercise and tends to bring the most stimulus. And if we really want specificity, like let's say we really want to target the lats or we want to target the biceps or the triceps or something like that, you know, we want that real targeting exercise to be first. But hold on, because compounds often don't really target just that muscle, they target other ones. So we have this kind of conundrum of like, oh, we want to isolate the muscle first, but then again, compounds are really good when they're done fresh. So how do we solve this problem? Well, it turns out we can have the best of both worlds, right? Compounds produce generally the highest forces. They expose your musculature to the highest forces, and they're best done fresh. You get more coordination. You can put more external load in, all as well. Isolations can really focus in on a muscle, so they're also really awesome to do. So we don't just want to say, oh, only compounds to grow muscle. Isolations are really awesome. But if we just do like three compounds at first and then do isolation last, maybe the isolated uh, exercise is just you're so tired by then, you don't get a lot out of it. So how do we solve this? The really cool thing is we're going to be able to use the pre-exhaust sort of uh, principle or technique in order to get something really cool together. We can do it all with the compound isolation compound sandwich. Here's how it works. You have a target muscle group. The first exercise you choose is a compound move that heavily prioritizes that muscle group. The second exercise you choose is an isolation for that muscle group. And then the last exercise, number three, we got the compound isolation compound. The last exercise is another compound move for that last muscle group, but it has at least one degree of freedom, which means that whichever muscle you're isolating, let's say triceps instead of chest, your chest can't take over when your triceps are tired because if your triceps don't produce a certain minimum amount of force, your exercise technique will collapse and you actually won't be able to do it. What do I mean by that? Let's look at the examples to explain exactly what's going on and how to do this. So first example for chest. Let's say we really want to fucking nuke our chest. First exercise, barbell press. Okay, great chest builder, hits some chest, hits a little bit of triceps, chest is really cooked, we're well on our way. Next exercise is a cable fly. Okay, you don't do the cable fly before the chest press because you want compounds first, great, check. Okay, and compounds first is a magical thing that's always true. It just so happens that uh, uh, much of the time, properly executed targeted compounds are just a really, really good way to, to drive a lot of stimulus. So you get the compound out of the way, Cable fly, and then your pecs are pretty fucking cooked. And then your third exercise can be another compound, the dumbbell press. Why dumbbell press? If we did machine press, we could get a really good stimulus. However, it's been shown that on something like a machine press, if your chest is pre-exhausted and you're using machine presses, technically speaking from a biomechanics perspective, because there's essentially no degrees of freedom, if we mechanically silenced your chest, sorry, uh, neurologically silenced your chest like we are, well, geez, that's a bit rough, but we cut the motor nerves to your pecs or, you know, gave you some kind of weird like nano drug that just turned off the motor nerves for the next five minutes. You could actually do a chest press with zero, zero chest whatsoever, just elbow extension. Okay, chest press machine is fixed. You're fixed into the seat. If you just extend, it looks exactly like you're pressing because there's nowhere else to go, no degrees of freedom. Your shit's not going to go out this way because the chest press machine prevents that from happening. If your chest 
is really tired, and this is the big drawback from improperly executed pre-exhaust, if your chest is pre-exhausted from flies and pressing, then when you go to a machine chest press, if your chest is really tired, your body's like, eh, we're not going to really turn it on that much. Like, hey, triceps, pick up the load. And then your triceps get a huge hit. So if your chest is really tired, you might have noticed on machine chest presses where there are no degrees of freedom, you make it a ball or tricep pump at the end of three sets and you're like, okay, I'll take the tricep pump, but I really wanted my chest to get activated. But it seemed like your chest was mostly off because it's so fucking tired. How do you solve that problem? You have to do an exercise, which is compound for sure, but it has to have a degree of freedom so that you have to activate the chest. For example, a dumbbell press. If the chest doesn't bring your humerus this way and you just activate the triceps, this is what's going to happen when you do a dumbbell press. Let's say your chest is neurologically silenced. You're going to go like this and the dumbbells are going to fall out. So in order for you to go like this and this, you have to have chest activation, which is to say that if you do barbell presses and then cable flies and your chest is really pretty exhausted, when you do dumbbell presses, your chest is the limiting factor and you're going to get fucked up beyond all recognition. Unbelievable chest stimulus. Check, 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 check. We're out, right? And then you can walk out of the gym with a huge chest pump. And that girl at the fucking, the gym counter, you're like, hey, hey. And she's like, oh my God, your pecs are so big. Take me on a date. Nostru Santos Domine. And her head fucking spins around. Then you know you're in the fucking money because satanic bitches always put out. I think, right? Or you'll die. Either way, you get a date. Ha ha. Your boy's got the hookup. Dating advice too. Quads. How do we do this properly with quads? Start with a compound. Hack squat. Excellent compound. Then you do a leg extension. Okay, we got the isolation. Now, if we were to do something like a leg press last, still good, but if your quads are really cooked and you're leg pressing, you can actually, again, because you're fixed into the back of the seat, your legs are fixed into the plate, you can technically do the entire leg press movement with only your glutes. Because if the femur is extended this way, your knees have to go. There's nowhere else to go. Zero degrees of freedom. However, if you do a barbell squat, if you're at the bottom of a barbell squat, right, here's your torso, here's your femur, if you simply activated your glutes and not quads, you would do this, bloop, and the bar would fall off your back and you would fall backwards and probably kill yourself. So in order for you to do this and actually rise up, you have to use your quads. And because they're pre-fatigued, they're a limiting factor. Try this shit. I'm not lying. Hack squat, then leg extension, then barbell squat. Make sure you take half of your normal working weight for barbell squat because you're going to walk out like a fucking, you know, newborn deer. You're going to dunk the squat and come back up. You're going to be like, oh, my fucking God, this is all quads. It's a thousand percent quads. That's right. With Renaissance periodization, multiply your quad growth by 10. Fuck, actually, um, unrelated, I, uh, I saw a legit ad pop up on YouTube when I was like watching some fucking, I forgot what video I was watching. This, the shit, because you know a lot of targeted ads and they figure I'm into fitness. The first, it was like a, one of those like 30 second um, video ads. And the first shit this motherfucker says was, <laughs> I can't say this without laughing. <laughs> Drinking a glass of water before bed can, um, can lead you to lose 46 pounds of fat in just a few weeks. And I was like, what? What the fuck have I been doing with stupid ass PhD I got telling people to cut their calories and increase their activity? Uh, one glass of water before bed, predictably only there's one thing, it makes you wake up in the middle of the night to pee. Fuck, goddamn lies out there. In any case, try the shit, it works fucking sweet. Last example, and something for you to use in your own training, you say you want to fucking really target the lats. Weighted pull-ups, great, awesome compound lat builder. Hits the biceps and rear delts too, blah, blah. Then you do a cable lat prayer, right? One of these straight arm extensions, really good technique, fry your lats, and then... Again, if you were fixed in place with some kind of rowing machine, you might actually be able to do most of the row with your biceps. Like if you just contract your biceps and it's fixed here, fixed here, yeah, like yeah, you could be pulling, but your lats are like, fuck that, we're taking the day off. A dumbbell row to the hips, uh-uh. Because if you just activate your biceps and not your lats, the dumbbell row begins to be a curl. You're bent over and you just do this and hit yourself in the face. Probably not very hard because you're tired with dumbbells. You look stupid. The girl at the gym counter is like, all right, all right. Uh, wow. And then you're for sure not getting any satanic hookups. Dumbbell row to the hips because your lats are pre-exhausted and they must be the limiting factor when they're pre-exhausted because there is a degree of freedom and they have to contract. You're getting fried fucking lats. You walk out of the gym, big ass lats, 
And the girl at the front desk is like, um, do you have like imaginary lat syndrome? And you're like, no, they're real. Look at me. I've got handle lats. And you do like a back pose. And you already know the joke. She says the satanic things. You go over to her house. Her head turns around. Somebody's getting laid. See you guys next time. Nostros, Santos, no. Dude, if you knew a girl was like a Satanist, would you still hit it? <laughs>